Hello, and welcome to Viewpoints. I have the opportunity today to talk with Admiral Dave Prokoski, who's addressing the multidisciplinary perspectives on homeland security and homeland defense. Dave, welcome, and thank you so much for coming out and talking with our class. Thanks, Kathleen. It's great to be here. Dave has retired from the Coast Guard after 33 years, has now mm -hmm. spent a couple of years in the private sector. Mm -hmm. And so my first question, Dave, is tell us about, or Admiral, tell us about what, how, how did your perspective change from government to private sector? Well, you know, I came into the private sector really wanting to continue, uh, is to the extent that I could, my government service, and really wanted to work in the security regime um, and support the U.S. federal government and state and local governments. Um, I've been in the private sector now for about two and a half years. It's been a great experience. Um, I've learned an awful lot about how business operates. I run a profit and loss uh, business unit for my company. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things that, that I always reflect on is uh, two things, you know, how much I've learned just in the two and a half years that I've been uh, in the private sector. And secondly, you know, how beneficial some of the lessons that I've learned in the private sector um, and what I've learned about government contracting overall would have been if I'd known it when I was, was in government. Um, and so it's, it's just been a great experience. Tell me about the role of innovation. Is, does that have a place in government thinking and government perspectives? And how about in the private sector? Yeah, in, innovation is absolutely critical. Um, innovation was a big part of what we, what we did in the, uh, in the Coast Guard. Uh, it was a, a program that we emphasized over the course of nearly my entire career. Uh, we had a, a dedicated innovation program um, that we thought was very successful and really produced some, some concrete results for us as a service. Uh, in the private sector, uh, if, if you don't innovate, you don't succeed. Um, and so uh, in the private sector, we have as a key part of our business strategy, how do we continue to innovate in the uh, services that we offer to our customers and uh, be very attentive to what they're telling us with respect to their current and future requirements and ways that we can provide service to them better uh, than what we're currently doing or in a different way than what we may currently be doing. One of the books, as you know, we're reading in class is Collaborate or Perish by Bill Bratton and, and Tuman. And is that, did they have it right? Is Collaborate or Perish really the way to run public-private organizations? I think it's the way to run public-private organizations. It's the way to run things inside the public sector. Nowadays, you know, it's, it's imperative that you collaborate, not just within your agency, uh, but across federal agencies and across government overall. Uh, if you don't do that, then you're really not going to achieve the best result. Uh, you're always going to be uh, somewhat short of achieving the outcomes that you want to achieve. Um, in the private sector, that's equally as important. Uh, if, if you want to succeed in meeting your business goals, if you want to provide the very best service to your customers, you've got to collaborate inside your company, you've got to collaborate with other private sector uh, enterprises, and you absolutely have to collaborate private sector to public sector. Um, you know, I think it's the, one of the bedrocks of, uh, of what we need to do going forward. Thanks, and I agree. Mm -hmm. One of our biggest challenges facing both Homeland Security and Homeland Defense, remember we're at the Center for Homeland Security mm -hmm. and Homeland Defense, right. Coast Guard uniquely positioned because they had a foot in both camps. Right, have a foot in both camps, actually have a foot in many, many camps. Uh, Coast Guard is a, is a military service at all times. It's a law enforcement agency at all times. It's an environmental protection agency. It's a regulatory agency. It's a safety agency. Uh, and so the Coast Guard is truly multidisciplinary. Um, and you know, that's really one of the strengths that we bring to the table is you know, we are very familiar with many, many different disciplines, with many different stakeholders, and can understand the positions that each one of those stakeholders brings to the discussion. If you were to just have your Homeland Security hat on, what do you think the largest threat is domestically? Yeah, the largest threat, in, in my view, domestically, actually the largest threat, in my view, overall, is um, our economy. Uh, if, if we don't have a robust economy in the United States, uh, funding for government programs will continue to decline, um, and we'll have to make some incredibly hard choices, which inevitably, depending on, on, on how deep reductions need to be, uh, may affect safety, may, may affect security. Um, and one of my biggest concerns with, with regard to that is that uh, oftentimes people will take a very short-term view to be able to fit into a, uh, a present-day funding requirement. And really what, what my hope is, and, and part of what we're doing inside my own company and uh, in work with our customers, is to really have, uh, have organizations take a longer-term view as, hey, what, what, what outcomes do I really want to drive toward in the longer term? How can I most effectively meet those outcomes? And uh, to be always considerate that sometimes if you uh, become super efficient, you sacrifice some level of effectiveness, and that may not be the balance you want to strike. And so we're really looking for 
rather than just uh, short-term perspectives, is really taking the longer view. Admiral, this morning you raised a fascinating point about how organizations function, and you, you caution the class to be careful what they measure. Mm -hmm. So you're speaking to practitioners with 20, 25 years of experience, mm -hmm. most at deputy chief, chief right. level, captain level, head of emergency management services, mm -hmm. all organized around measuring activity. Is that the right measurement versus measuring outcome? I think that um, the right measurement is to measure outcomes. And you may uh, get to measure outcomes through activity measures, but you shouldn't stop at just activity measures. Um, you know, I think that w what people need to do is step back and say, uh, hey, for, for this particular program, here's the outcome that I desire to achieve. And, and the outcome may come in steps. You may say, in, in two years, I'd like to achieve this outcome. In four, I see this outcome being achievable. In six, this outcome being achievable. And then design measures that will allow you to assess whether or not you're achieving those levels of outcome. That becomes particularly important as we uh, place more and more emphasis on prevention activities and overall resiliency um, of our structures in, in the United States. Uh, and, and to do that, you really need to look at, at outcomes that are very hard to measure. Um, and you may, in fact, need to use several surrogate measures to kind of get at that outcome. Key thing from my perspective as well is because this is hard, oftentimes um, people will just uh, study it, try to come to a solution, know that they can't, and then sort of shelve it, put it on the table, and only come back to it if forced to re-examine it again. Uh, and, and in my view, that doesn't really help you best manage uh, your programs, best be able to articulate your business case, if you will, for a hey, why is this a good investment for the United States government? What is the return on investment? what good things result um, from taking taxpayer money and applying it to this problem in this way. Tougher question, how do we measure the outcomes of the Department of Homeland Security? Um, it is a tough question because the Department of Homeland Security is increasingly focusing on prevention activities as, as they should. Um, and I think the way you measure that is, is, you, is you look at things that you want to achieve. For example, to be a resilient society, to uh, be able to uh, have awareness of what developing threats are um, and uh, look at trends in communities. You can look at surrogate measures. For example, uh, you know, what, what is your relationship uh, with certain key uh, groups inside communities? Is, is that relationship getting better over time? Because arguably, if you have a good relationship, you have a good trust partnership uh, with members of the community, you can uh, become better at prevent, you know, being aware of and then preventing uh, bad things from happening inside the United States. So you know, I think in a lot of cases you do have to use those surrogate measures, but they need to be uh, measures that, that you can really just say, you know, rather than just declaring that, hey, I've, I have um, established a relationship with this organization um, because I've talked to this person and this person and this person, to me that's not adequate. You need to be able to say, here's my relationship with this organization, here have been the beneficial results of that relationship, um, uh, and, and measure that. Unfortunately, you know, that, that will most likely get into some level of activity measure, uh, but that's, that's okay as long as it rolls up to achieving an overall outcome. So if I'm understanding your point correctly, it's building relationships that are sustainable and scalable and not personality driven. Right. And if that's the platform, how do you teach that to the young recruit that you're bringing in to mm -hmm. be that future leader? Yeah, and, and you know, I think the, um, the foundation of everything with respect to relationships, whether it's your personal relationships, your business relationships, your professional relationships, is do you have a foundation of trust uh, with the other person? And you know, core values uh, come into play in a, in a very big way in that regard. Um, core values in the private sector, core values in, in the public sector, usually integrity um, is, is a key foundation there. And so you know, I think what you tell somebody coming in is, um, you know, emphasize that you know, relationships are important. Uh, as you progress in your career, they're going to become more and more and more important. And so as you establish relationships with people, make sure they have a, a strong foundation and trust. And it's important, too, that uh, you know, in, in most um, areas of work nowadays, whether it's in the private sector or the public sector, it's not uncommon for people to have um, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different uh, jobs over the course of a career. Uh, it's very important that as you establish those relationships in job one, that you nurture them and continue to maintain them as you progress uh, professionally, because you really never know um, how that relationship may enable you to achieve uh, success in the future. Um, and, and plus, it's, it's just a good practice of, uh, hey, you know, I've, I've established a relationship with an individual. 
Uh, I've maintained it. Um, relationships over the course of 10 years, for example, will be much stronger than a relationship formed in just the last six months. How do you judge the value of this kind of education at a center like this where we, we go out and we recruit the best and the brightest and then we send them back to make change in their organizations? Mm -hmm. How should we measure their success? Well, you know, I think it's, it's imperative for everybody um, to be on a journey of continual learning throughout your entire life. Um, you know, there shouldn't be a day that goes by that you don't learn something new that you didn't know uh, the day before. And you should really endeavor as, as, you, as you plot out your professional career progression what kinds of skills do I need to acquire over the course of time? And what are the opportunities for me to get those skills? Um, I think programs such as this are critical to that because uh, you, you, you are able to do a couple of things at the same time. Uh, one is you, you certainly increase your base of knowledge. Uh, you definitely increase your professional network. Um, and importantly, in, in programs such as this, uh, you get to hear and understand the perspectives of people who have very different assignments come from very different um, uh, career history, personal history. And so it really helps you understand all sides of the argument. And it's only when you do that, I mean, it's really easy to decide something when you have 10 people in a room and they all think the same way, you can quickly come to a decision. That decision is oftentimes not the best decision. What you really wanna do as a leader uh, is to be able to consider all aspects of an issue and then make the best judgment having that full perspective on the plate. Admiral, thank you very much for sharing your time with us on Viewpoints. The fact that we're able to consistently bring practitioners with a great deal of mm -hmm. lived experience, the phenomenology of what they've done on their jobs, mm -hmm. add academic rigor to that, launch them back into their organizations to bring effective change is how we measure success here. Mm -hmm.